This course will cover essential C++ infrastructure tools and their role in building a robust foundation for the future learning of C++. As a C++ programmer, you would be doing software engineering with C++. You're not just going to be copy pasting code throughout your career. This simple change in your perspective can help you grow exponentially in your career, independent of your employers and managers. Remember, you get an appraisal for excelling at delivering software, not just writing some interview portal style convoluted code, which no one can read and has zero evidence of being faster in production other than somebody writing it somewhere in a comment on some interview portal. So please remember, this course is about your willingness to become better and it depends on your actions around the assignments that are going to be provided to you. And the sole objective of the course remains to make you self-sufficient when it comes to learning C++. The course is going to be very hands-on and it relies on your ability to follow up. So please pay attention to the uh, entire coursework that is going to be provided to you in the next couple of hours. The only thing I'll remind you is that use open source and free trial tools only because that in itself is a skill for which you will be awarded in whatever company you are working. That is saving costs. So start learning early and that will be the theme throughout this course. So please remember that part. Let's talk about certain practical problems around self-learning C++. Often people join a job and then start learning a C++. So when a student joins a job or is even doing an assignment, the approach of solving a problem is that the student will straight away jump into a search engine like Google or maybe go to Stack Overflow and try to find the code that matches the problem statement and just copy paste the solution and move on. Many people do that even on the interview portals because uh, the dopamine high of having uh, those green text on the screen matters more. But they don't pay attention to the accuracy of the sources from where that code is coming. Does it really solve the problem? And that's where these tools like search generative AI, they seem like a solution, but they are just tools. And you need to be better than that. And that's what this course is going to help you learn. Let's briefly talk about the problems with these tools, that why they cannot be trusted. So search basically tells you the most famous solution. And that is based on the ads algorithm or the SEO, which is the search engine optimization. Now, they are completely agnostic of what problem you are solving. If a certain page behaves the way the ad algorithm likes, it will be rated highly. There's nothing wrong in it. That's how that business model works. But your job isn't to pick the best blog available out there. Your job is to fix the problem which you have at your hand, which makes your product better. These are two different problem statements. So please beware that search is a tool, not a solution. Tools like Stack Overflow, which are good at providing you short code snippets, might be irrelevant in your case. If you have noticed for the past few years, the top ranking results are like 10 or maybe sometimes 13 years old, which means that the C++ standard has moved on. But the answer which you plan to copy paste is actually deprecated. The compiler might not complain about it because of the language's backward compatibility, but then you are actually importing a bug. So you are actually destroying the code quality by copy pasting. And the tools are not in a right shape to stop you. And that's the problem. That you are actually creating a problem based on loopholes in multiple different programs. And that is a very bad programming practice. And I have trust that you really want to do better. That's why you are taking this course. The new trend in the past few years has been to take a Udemy course the moment you get stuck. Unfortunately, Udemy courses are exclusively based on instructor's experience. 
and uh, just because somebody says beginner to master in 60 hours doesn't mean that you will become that master remember you can only refund within the first 30 days udemy doesn't care about your progress after those 30 days the instructor also many a times goes missing and you don't get answers to your q a and again you fall back into the bad practices of using search engines as your hope for solving problems so remember the course is just a guideline you need a learning framework you need to understand the bigger picture and this course will explain you those things but if you don't execute the hands-on it will be just another udemy course and just another udemy certificate over the past few years i have noticed that a lot of developers are getting addicted to courses every time they get stuck on something so that is highly counterproductive because you need to solve a problem within a fixed time frame you cannot keep uh, taking a beginner to advanced course for every small piece of problem you have as a software engineer remember you have to grow as a decision maker much faster than people had to do 10 years ago the competition is getting stronger and the availability of tools out in the open is making things harder for people to just keep copy pasting and build a career so remember you have to understand things you have to practice them and build your own decision framework that is the best way to grow in your career and stay relevant for a long time otherwise the generative ai tools are coming for your job the trust in generative ai provided solutions as of today which is in 2023 is not highly credible because you don't know from where that code is being learned and presented to you but if you are creating a code base from scratch then the code generation capabilities of generative ai can be trusted a little more so that is a decision only an experienced programmer can make somebody who has been coding for thousands of hours you cannot fake or simulate this kind of experience you might get through certain interviews but when you are dealing with compilers and tools they are going to be unforgiving and that's where people burn out and they don't get appraisals and they become really really miserable don't be one of those people so how to improve so the solution is pretty straightforward the first step is identify the problem clearly define the problem you are trying to solve and then make sure you understand the requirements and constraints of the problem basically you need to understand what are going to be the after effects of your actions and if you don't understand them then you have to work with a team that's where the people aspect of programming comes into picture this course will only stick to the technology aspect of things but when you are doing software engineering as a job it is equally important you know how to ask questions to other people and how to work as a team i have dedicated separate courses for those as well but that is part of the career planning not c++ so we will stick to the technical aspect of things which means that you need to identify and define the problem first before diving into anything else now here comes the most important step instead of doing anything else you must first check the language and the framework documentation if you are working purely with a language problem then you go and look at the language documentation the current version the uh, appropriate operating system whatever are the constraints you first go and check there if you are working with a framework which is written in a particular language then you have to go to the framework documentation first because it is the responsibility of the framework developers to inform you about that problem and its solution right so you trying to directly dive deep into the source code of the framework is a waste of time first verify the documentation and there is a good chance that you will find certain information that can get you unstuck it might not solve your problem but it will at least get you unstuck if the language and framework documentation falls short then you can use search engines and now even tools like chat gpt so as i mentioned earlier these are tools not solutions so use them like tools so be specific with your questions 
adapt your questions if you are not getting the right answer but remember whatever answer you get you have to still go ahead and confirm right so use these tools but don't rely on these tools sometimes you might have to dive deeper into uh, online forums or stack overflow independent of the search engine so you might have to use search on those portals as well but remember again you are using it as a tool and the uh, cautions which i informed you earlier still apply here after you have found certain credible solution you need to evaluate it and this is where the rest of the tools ecosystem becomes highly critical and we would be discussing that because that is as important as learning c++ because you can get the syntax from many places but if you cannot verify the solution in your product and your particular use case then you are leaving a bug open and that is going to cost a lot of time and money in the future and that's what we are trying to avoid by making this short course the most important thing in software engineering is documenting and documenting your solution will help that if somebody later runs into a similar issue might not have to spend the same amount of time as you did in searching the solution and if you had to search the solution and somebody else didn't document it in past you are well aware of the importance of documentation so please ensure that you don't become an obstacle a special mentioned about using chat gpt remember never paste any production code into chat gpt to get any suggestions around it if you don't take away anything else from the course apart from this even that is a huge learning so please remember that part that chat gpt is not a place where any of your production code should be pasted always remember that there is a lot of buzz around the chat gpt and generative ai tools all you need to remember is they are just tools they are not solutions so you will have to use them judiciously in many cases they might not add to your productivity at all and you should be open to that possibility as well so experiment with them play with them i have certain courses around how to use them in a very specific manner as well but remember that's a budding field and it is not necessary to use them your job is to solve the end users problem using c++ focus on that in case you are wondering how tools like chat gpt or git copilot are able to predict code well basically in crux they are being trained on existing code bases so what they try to do is just fill in the blanks and guess what the next possible word can be and if they have been trained only on a c++ code base let's say hundreds and millions of c++ code bases then they tend to understand its syntax so whatever code is being generated it's not really tested by the model at all it can have syntactical issues as well right so uh, it is basically just trying to imitate based on the patterns it has seen in the past so that's all you need to remember that it is a pattern filling tool it doesn't understand the programming language to put it another way the programmatic correctness of the generated text is not the goal of a large language model so just remember that that the llms are just doing a pattern filling they are not compilers so they can generate a code that might not compile so you have to be very particular about the suggestions you are going to take from these kind of tools another issue with online code or code generated by chat gpt in particular is the programming style because all the teams follow separate programming styles and the compilers accept syntactically correct code the style is left to the developers and that's where things might vary and you might be introducing something which might trigger a peer review discussion a pr might go into a very stylistic kind of a discussion which is again a waste of time so remember that Uh, while using tools or online code you have to be aware of style as well 
and we will talk about tools which can help you fix that problem as well. So that's the uh, core objective of this course. Again, talk about the peripheral issues which take up most of your time uh, while you're doing software engineering. Remember, you will be doing all these things a lot more compared to the amount of time you spend writing code. As you start dealing with more complicated code, you will realize that concurrency happens to be one of the complicated things around any programming language, especially in C++ because it has been an evolving set of features that are getting shipped. As far as LLMs are concerned, they really don't understand concurrency. They might spit out certain code which is syntactically using concurrent features of C++, but inherently they don't understand what is the uh, critical region and those kind of things. So if you are requesting for those kind of codes from ChatGPT, please don't. Considering all the buzz, here is the final reminder that large language models or LLM works with pattern matching approach without any context of uh, your problem or any domain knowledge. So please don't rely on them for these things. It is your job as a C++ developer to connect the domain with the language. That's where you will remain relevant in the industry for a long time. Otherwise, you will just get replaced by some code generation script. So uh, please don't make yourself redundant in that way. And having made all these warnings about ChatGPT, it still has a lot of use for you as a programmer. And you will see those things in the assignments, which you can definitely perform and that too for free. So don't worry about the uh, tools a lot. Just remember that you have to use them judiciously whenever you choose to use them. Before moving towards the tools ecosystem, I would like to highlight something about the programming language itself. That uh, C++ standardization has been happening for a very long time. The first official standard was released in 98. That's why C++ 98 tag exists. And then it has undergone a lot of revisions and C++ 11, 14, 17, 20, now 23 are going to be released. The reason for you to understand these various standards and the release process of the language is very simple. You are not always going to be working with the cutting edge standard. Hence, you should always understand what your code base requires and use the standard that matches your code base. Knowing only the advanced features is kind of useless. So please be judicious with your self-learning when it comes to the new standards. To keep it very short, basically the ISO C++ committee is the governing body which defines how a C++ standard is uh, to be structured. What are the features that will go in? What are the new syntaxes that will be introduced and those kind of things. So it is a kind of a bureaucratic process which takes care of the shaping of the language. And hence you see that there are certain features which people really want, but they are not present in the language for some technical reason, which is documented in the committee meetings and notes. But again, it is a kind of a democratic process. Hence, it takes a little while. And that's where the third party tools ecosystem can come to your help if you really want a feature. So to get into these details is equally important because the more decisions you have to make around the future roadmap of your product, these features will become relevant to your code base. And you should be aware when to switch to a newer version of the language. As I mentioned that you have to choose the right language version to learn best, which matches your code base. But at the same time, you also have to be aware that if you can spot inefficiencies in the older implementations, then you have to upgrade your code base. Many people feel that just by changing the standard from, uh, let's say C++ 14 to 17 in a make file, and if the code compiles, then you have migrated to a newer version. That is not true. You have to actually implement the new features as well. C++ is a backward compatible language. So there will be very few deprecations when it comes to recompiling with a newer standard. But that doesn't mean you have actually moved to a new standard. 
there is a huge difference. That is the make file change is just a wrapper, right? So you, you need to be aware of what it really means to be using a new standard. You don't, you can't fake it and get away with it. So let's work over a quick cycle of how a new feature ends up in a standard. So the first step is proposal submission, where one or more of the committee members come together and submit a white paper with the proposal about the feature. So they can give a pseudo implementation as well using the existing standard. Remember, so they are, their starting point is always the existing standard and they provide additional information based on which a new certain feature can be introduced into the language. So sometimes it can be a simple behavior which is getting introduced, so no new syntax will be required, but there are always chances that a new syntax gets involved as well. So new keywords and uh, new facilities in the compilers will be introduced for, will need to be introduced for this feature to work successfully. So this proposal is now being submitted by the committee members. The ISO CPP committee meets on a regular basis. So during those meetings, these reviews are uh, done for the proposals which have been accepted. So it follows a very specific timeline that there is a time deadline for a proposal submission and the committee meeting is going to happen. So it, it is a well-structured process. So you need not worry about the internals of that process. If you are interested, there are talks about it. But here you just need to remember that it's a collective decision now that needs to be taken by the ISO CPP committee which uh, talks about the proposal amongst themselves and comes up with a review report based on that discussion. If the particular proposal shows enough promise, then it is graduated to a working draft and it has to make certain updates and resubmit for review so that the committee can uh, move towards finalization of that particular feature. So now it goes into that working draft mode where it is constantly upgraded and resubmitted till a certain consensus around its final state can be achieved. So based on the final deadline set up by the committee, once all the proposals have uh, been reviewed and the ones which have made it through the working draft process are now ready to be finalized as a standard. And based on that final discussion, a particular standard is generated which is then handed off to the compiler manufacturers who can uh, actually implement that standard. So the implementation can be machine specific and uh, it gets into a very different uh, execution mode, which is not a responsibility of the ISO CPP committee. The committee comes up with the standard that is their uh, final outcome. The implementation is done by the compiler vendors. So you need to remember that the compiler vendors don't control the language, the ISO CPP committee controls the language. So based on the explanation of how a feature makes it to a language, you might be wondering that why bother about the new version of the language? Why not keep life simple? If everything is working, just let it be so that we can take our vacations and we can have a wonderful work-life balance. But you forget that a new language version brings a lot of performance improvements, which saves costs, which saves software engineering effort in many cases as well. It makes code more readable. It brings in bug fixes, which can actually be causing certain problems in your software, which you were unaware of. And there are new utilities and facilities to improve your productivity. That is the whole goal of coming up with a newer version. Otherwise, the whole effort is wasted. If it is just for certain uh, semantic or syntactic purposes, just adding certain cosmetic uh, convenience to the language, then having to wait for a new feature is pointless. I agree on that front. But there are always many features which are way beyond cosmetic changes. And you might be aware that the move to C++11 bringing in concurrency features into the language has been a huge asset. So please be aware that 
whenever a new language version comes in it has to evolve uh, through a certain set of discussions and that value now becomes part of your code base as well so it helps you as an individual to improve as a programmer as well so don't miss out on that opportunity but be judicious and as we will see in the rest of the course that there are a lot of dependencies when you are changing a version and you cannot ignore that responsibility as a developer. To wrap it up, I will just walk over the very brief aspects of history of the language which are relevant to this course. Right? So uh, the whole idea is that knowing the language's history helps you make certain decisions around the peripheral tools which you are going to use. And that's the only reason why I am introducing this to you. So uh, C++ is a general purpose programming language and it has been developed since 1980s. So it was developed as an extension for C and it maintains a backward compatibility for a C code. And that is a, a root of many features as well as problems in the language. And we won't be diving deeper into them, but you just need to be aware of the fact that the backward compatibility in C uh, is a double-edged sword. And eventually it, it costs a lot of projects, uh, certain design decisions don't go well and they have to rewrite the code. Right? So that's a discussion for another advanced course, not this one. And from a advantages point of view, it, C++ is known for its efficiency, high performance, flexibility. It is widely used for developing complex systems and examples will be given to you in the upcoming lectures. And one of the most prominent features is the object oriented programming approach of the language which can be further extended uh, using templates, exceptions, multiple inheritance. So C++ has many advantages and with those come a lot of limitations as well that it is a complex language to learn in a single shot. The memory control of the language is prone to mistakes and bugs and it can get difficult to debug. And that's why this course will focus on how you can build harnesses upfront so that uh, while you are developing code in a full-fledged focus, you don't get stuck because of any of these issues. So you build your protection first and then you start taking risks. In this section, we'll talk about the importance of uh, learning not just the C++ language but also the peripheral tools that come along with it. So this section will start now getting into the crux of the objective which we are trying to understand which is the ecosystem around C++ necessary to get the code to the end user and solve the problem. You might still be wondering why is it even important to learn these tools along with C++ Aren't there enough uh, tech leads, team leads, engineering managers, the IT development staff who are going to get all these things done for you, right? So why should you bother? You can maybe think about it once after four or five years experience when you are seeking a promotion. And that's where the problem is. That C++ is a complex language with a wide range of applications and it takes time to master it beyond syntax and semantics. So in addition to the language itself, the developers need to have a solid understanding of the various tools so that they can make products faster, which can reach the end users faster and software as a business can thrive. Remember the goal is not for you to write C++ code. The goal is to solve somebody's problem who will pay back in return for those services. You have to think of it as a business. And by learning these tools and technologies, you can build a strong foundation for shipping solid C++ code. And that's what will propel your career forward. Knowing syntaxes is kind of getting redundant because now even tools like 
uh, chat gpt or codexes open api codexes can generate code it is how to shape it into a product where the humans excel and i want you to become one of them now let's turn our attention to the tools that are essential for effective c++ development these are the primary tools there can be more additional tools which i encourage you to explore but this is the basic set which you will definitely need if you want to ship a c++ code the most important primary tool is the compiler which is basically going to take your higher level language of c++ which is written in a human readable format and convert it into a machine readable execution uh, unit right so basically the goal is that your logic should be executed by the machine and compilers will ensure that it can be achieved build systems such as cmake they will help you manage complex software projects by automating the build processes and handling dependencies so remember while you are learning the language you can get away by writing short code and understand a particular feature of the language but when you are delivering a software solution to the end user the complexity is imminent and build systems will become necessary version control systems such as git are used to track changes of your code over a time and collaborate with other developers like i mentioned software engineering is a team effort and multiple people working on a similar code base or the same code base at a given time is imminent so you have to keep track of changes so that none of the changes are lost and version control systems solve that problem automated testing frameworks are essential because uh, they will enable you to write and run tests automatically here the two aspects of the framework are important first is the ability to write tests and the second one is to run them in a automated manner and both are equally important because if you cannot confirm the changes which you have made then there is a good chance they will come back as a bug and waste time and in software as a business that is not at all entertained debuggers are tools which help you try to understand the flow in a working program so they will help you in fixing bugs sometimes they can be used even while you try to understand certain code workflows right so debuggers are not a tool that you use in production directly but it is an intermediate translator of the execution of the source code that has been shipped so reading a code might not explain you what exactly is happening in the production especially in cases of concurrent systems so there if you want to interfere in the working uh, code to see what is the state of the system then debugger can help you but debuggers come with a lot of overheads as well and as an experienced programmer you should be aware when to use a debugger so i have separate courses for these kind of issues as well because they fall under programming practices but in this particular course you just need to be aware how to introduce a debugger into your system so that you can use it whenever it becomes necessary once a code starts functioning now your next goal becomes how to make it run even faster ideally the code should be running as fast as possible whenever you are shipping it so if the language itself is not getting faster then you have to make certain changes in your code and for doing so the performance and profiling tools can help you identify the potentials where changes can be made it is always possible that you have already saturated all the opportunities but you need to confirm that based on these tools as well so that no one else tries to do that again another interesting set of tools are the static analysis tools which basically can help you catch issues before they get shipped basically during the compilation stages itself because remember the compiler is imposing a lot of rules which have been uh, set up by the standards committee around how the language should behave and the static analysis tools can extend those rules and try to understand the logic of your program 
and spot any inconsistencies if possible. So these kind of tools can help you find certain logical issues, which is very helpful because syntactically they are correct. So if you are subtracting a number from itself, just because uh, the autocomplete put in a wrong uh, variable name over there, it's a human error. But from a logical point of view, it is incorrect. So a human reader might not be able to spot it easily, but the static analysis tool can raise a flag saying that you are uh, deducting the same variable from itself. Are you really sure you want to do this? In most of the cases, that will be a wrong answer and hence you can mark it as an error during your compilation phase itself. From a software engineering perspective, let's assume that you are joining a company and as a C++ developer on the first day, setting up your development environment will be your first task. And the following steps is what you will definitely be doing, which is setting up the basic environment, setting up the compiler and build tools, configuring your version control system, ensuring you can integrate your automated testing frameworks and setting up your debugging and configuration. The rest of the course, I will give you tasks as to how to dive deeper around these. But remember, I am not going to give you instructions how to do it. I am going to give you guidelines and you have to make a decision and execute on it. So please remember that you will be doing a lot of simple things, but if you know how to do them well under pressure situations, you will thrive. So remember, don't underestimate these tasks because they look simple. Let's briefly talk about the basics of compilers and compilation process. Again, I won't be diving deep into how to install them. That's your task. I'll just introduce you to the few famous ones. GCC is the new compiler collection. It is a widely used open source compiler that supports multiple programming languages. C++ happens to be one of them. It is known for its portability across various operating systems its uh, optimization techniques for generating better code and uh, strict conformance to the C++ standard. So whenever a committee releases a finalized standard draft, GCC picks it up and uh, implements it. So that's how it becomes a reality. Clang is another open source compiler developed by the LLVM project. It supports C++ along with other languages. Clang is known for its faster compilation times Better, better error diagnostics and it is compatible with GCC as well. It is often used as a drop-in replacement for GCC. So remember, it is just a compiler is a tool. So your program doesn't change. It is one of the build tools that is changing. MSVC or Microsoft Visual C++ is a proprietary compiler developed by Microsoft. So its source code is not available for everyone. It was specifically designed for the Windows platform. It's uh, integrated with the Visual Studio IDE and it provides a wide range of features including debugging and performance analysis tools, but it is built for the Windows platform. So you need to remember that part. There are other compilers on the market as well, like the Intel's ICC and other embedded systems, compiler developers like WindRiver and other companies also write compilers. So it is not a proprietary asset to write a compiler. It is just something that anyone can take the standard C++ standard and ensure that they write a tool which can convert that language into assembly. And basically they can become compiler vendors. The reason for there being very few compiler vendors is the fact that it is a very complex software engineering project to maintain a compiler and ensure that it is always working correctly and hence not a lot of people get into this business. Let's take a bird's eye view at the various stages of the compiler. And this is important because whenever you see a compilation error, you have to be more specific at what stage it has happened. And you can detect it from the error message which is printed on the screen. This can reduce the uh, amount of time you need to communicate a particular error to your peers. So instead of just saying something generic, 
if you are specific they can recommend you a solution faster right so this is a way informed engineer can communicate and that's the reason i'm bringing it up i will provide you enough uh, context to dive deeper because compiler design is considered a complex subject because it requires certain prerequisites of computer science but you can still learn it on your own and it will definitely boost your career if you want to continue on technical track for next few years. Parsing is the first stage of the compilation process. In this stage, the compiler reads the source code which you have written and it constructs something called as an abstract syntax tree. So this step checks the syntax of the code and ensures that it is well formed according to the language grammar. So your takeaway from this should be that if your code is parsing correctly, it means it is syntactically correct. And that's all. It doesn't mean that there are no bugs in it. There are no syntactical bugs in it. That's what this stage can guarantee. In the semantic analysis stage, the compiler checks the semantics of the code. It basically means it is validating the correct usage of variables, are the right data types being used, how the function calls are being used, this also performs type checking and enforces scoping rules, which basically means that you cannot use a variable anywhere you like and assume that since you have written a syntactically correct statement, it should eventually execute. It doesn't work that way. Your code has to be consistent with the language rules and semantic analysis phase of the compiler ensures that it adheres to those rules. Once it is confirmed that the code is syntactically correct and it is semantically correct as well, now it can be put further to the optimization stage where the compiler applies various techniques to improve the performance and reduce the size of the generated code. So these optimizations can be performed at different levels as such as a function inlining, loop unrolling, dead code elimination. Now these are techniques which you will learn further in your career. I'm just introducing you to the keywords which will happen automatically as part of the compiler's optimization stage. So you need not do it by hand. That is the message which I'm trying to convey to you through this explanation. And finally, once the optimizations have completed, the compiler is now sure that it can generate uh, assembly code which is optimized uh, for the particular machine. So the final stage of compil uh, compilation process is where the compiler will translate this particular optimized code into assembly language because the machines understand the assembly language only. Right? So based on whichever platform it needs to be executing on, the compiler will generate a assembly according to that particular platform. So for the sake of understanding the entire ecosystem, we'll use this one simple program, which is the Hello World program. And this is the program which you need to take from start to end, because that will show you the complexity of the ecosystem keeping the language outside the equation. We will just require the IO stream header because we would be printing to the uh, C out. But other than that, no other headers will be required in this program. To keep things a little interesting, uh, we will use a print function instead of just a print statement. So in this case, the print function doesn't return anything. It just accepts a string and prints out to the std out whatever the string it has been provided. It doesn't do anything other than that. In the main function, we will call the print function and provide it input as a string hello world. And the output of this program should be that the string hello world is printed on the standard out output and the function exits, the program exits. That's all. That's what this simple program is going to do. The rest of the tool ecosystem will be built around these few simple lines of C++ code. Remember that if you are focusing on the C++ language only, then what else you are missing will start becoming evident to you in the upcoming lectures. 
and you will be surprised to know the amount of complexity waiting for you out there. Now let's start taking a look at a tool which will help you build and package your Hello World program. CMake is a powerful build system and a project generator. It simplifies the build process across different platforms and compiler tool chains. So as we saw that there are multiple compilers and you already know there are multiple platforms like Mac OS, Linux, Windows, right? So CMake just makes the whole process consistent across different tools and platforms. It is widely adopted in the C++ community. It provides the consistent way to build and package applications, which is critical in saving time and a lot of costs of software engineering. To reiterate, CMake works on multiple platforms. It's a cross-platform support tool. So CMake works on Windows, Mac OS, Linux, and other platforms. It can generate project files for various build systems as well, such as Make, Ninja, Visual Studio. So as you can see, the number of variables and possibilities keeps increasing with every tool. CMake also allows you to easily configure your build environment. It can manage dependencies. It can set compilation flags, which makes it easier to maintain complex projects and it can support multiple configurations as well, such as do you want a debug build, do you want a release build. So CMake becomes your build manager. Here I'm just introducing you to the basic CMake lists.txt file, but remember you have to go through the documentation and do it for yourself. The reason I'm presenting you the bare minimum requirement is to help you stop from diving too deep into that documentation. Because remember, it is about getting it done, not about showcasing your understanding of how CMake works. For this course, I am helping you focus on what is required right now. And that's the skill you have to learn, that you should be able to differentiate between what is urgent right now and what you should understand in the longer run and you can invest time later but getting things done at the moment matters more. So here I'm just providing you this file so that you know when to stop while you are reading the CMake documentation. The first thing you need to inform the CMake system is the minimum required version of CMake itself, right? So the keywords CMake minimum underscore required and the version tag with 3.10 says that unless the system has a CMake greater than or equal to version 3.10, don't proceed. The next information which the CMake build system requires is the name of the project. So the project keyword followed by the uh, string hello world informs the build system that the project name should be hello world. And finally, the action which we want CMake to perform is to create an executable named hello underscore world from a file named hello.cpp. So the add executable will perform that task on our behalf. To summarize what CMake is going to do with your code is that CMake uses a two-step process, right? First, it has to generate a build system based on the CMake file, a CMake lists.txt file, which you are going to provide it. And that file will help it build the environment based on the tools available to it on that particular system, right? And then the build system is used to compile and link the application. So the first stage is to generate the build system. The next stage is to actually compile the application. So here are the basic set of commands which you will be reading in the CMake documentation as well, but I'll just inform you that how they represent the two stages. So first you make a directory called build to isolate the artifacts from your current code base. Then you go into the build directory and invoke the CMake utility to generate the build system, right? That's what CMake dot dot represents that you are inside the build directory and you are saying that generate a build system for the parent directory, okay? 
and then you can call the make command which is going to execute the compilation stages for your current application. So remember these are just guidelines I'm providing you to introduce you to what you will be doing. This is going to be part of your issue tracker as well. So follow the assignments and do this at the appropriate point in time and whatever issues you face you have to solve it on your own. That is what is going to make you a better software engineer not listening to this lecture or getting a Udemy certificate or clearing an interview or listening to some other talk. It is actually doing this thing yourself and getting through it on your own. Version control systems, sometimes referred to as VCS, help developers manage changes to the source code over a period of time. They can track modifications, enable col collaborations among the developers like we discussed a little earlier and they allow for easily reverting previous versions of code when necessary. So now that you are on a learning trajectory, mistakes are imminent and it is ideal to make mistakes early in your learning path so that whenever you are working in production, you are confident about the changes you are making. And that's when the version control system comes to your aid that under high pressure situations, if at all a mistake has slipped through, you should be able to safely revert to a version that was functional. Hence, I am integrating the version control system in your learning trajectory as well. Git or sometimes called as JIT, uh, the name is basically a pronunciation so don't get caught up in how you call it i prefer to call it git so i'll continue to call it so but that is not the point so git is a widely used distributed vcs and it provides fast performance it has efficient branching and merging and it has robust data integrity which means that it is really really hard to lose changes in git it happens but it's very rare so it enables developers to work on multiple features or bug fixes simultaneously. So this makes collaboration easier and more efficient. So you might ask that I am an individual developer, so why would I need this? You still need this because you might be working on multiple features on your own project at the same time and you don't want the changes to be intermixed. And this is what I want you to practice in a controlled environment because the simpler the code, the easier it is to understand what the tool is doing. The first day you walk into a job and if you have million lines of code to deal with, trust me, you are not going to feel comfortable or you are not even going to get time to understand whether it is the source control tool that is going wrong, the compiler tool that is going wrong, or it is your operating system what is going on it will take you at least a couple of months just to understand all the tools being used so it's better that you experience the tools up front so that you can spot where the problem might be coming from and ask specific questions just to remind you specific questions can get you an appraisal much faster so please understand the gravity of using these tools up front in a controlled environment So firstly, I'll warn you, don't install a Git server locally. Now, what does that mean? Because we are talking about initializing a repository. Now, you would say that you are confusing us. Actually, this is the confusion which I want you to solve for yourself. I'll guide you through what the problem is and where you can find the solution. But you have to actually perform the actions to realize that why this confusing bit of knowledge exists in the first place. So the thing is that Git in itself is supposed to be a distributed code repository, which basically means that every, every developer using that particular Git will have a copy of a repository on their system and they can push and pull changes between each other. Now that is highly inconvenient and hence tools like GitHub centralize that ecosystem on a server side. So in this case, I'll recommend you to use a tool like GitHub, which basically provides the same services as Git, but the server resides in the cloud. And what you have on your machine is a Git client. 
So when you are initializing this repository, you would be doing that in the cloud so that you can share it with your friends. If you initialize it locally on your machine itself, then you will find it hard to actually share it with your friend. So I recommend that you try both. And again, stop as soon as you have performed the basic actions. Don't try to understand everything. Understand the bigger picture, but first focus on what needs to get done. Again, that is the focus of the course, to understand what needs to get done and getting it done. Once you have your repository set up, now you can start adding files to it. So currently, I assume you will have two basic files which are necessary, which is the cmakelists.txt and hello.cpp. Remember, you do, need not check in the binary or the executable that has got generated. That is the good practice. Because if you are generating that exe and submitting to the cloud, and if somebody checks out that code on a different platform, that file is not going to work, right? So that's the whole point of committing the code and having somebody else access it and build it on their platform. So this is where the platform specific nature of C++ started, starts showing up. Once you have initialized your repository, checked it out, added your files in it, now it is time to make your first commit, which is basically adding your files into the version control system. So again, the directions to perform these actions will be part of your project plan, which will be provided to you in the assignments. You should be adding more tasks to it along with estimations. And at the end of the course, you will have that complete project, which you need to go over step by step and keep updating your project tracker and keep connecting the issues with your comments. So these are the things you will be learning through this. Remember, our code is still that very simple hello world program itself. Now what you are doing is actually software engineering and not coding. And keep an eye on how much effort it takes to learn these tools and get them right. As you modify your C++ code, so in this case, you can make a very small change, maybe add another function to print something else. Very trivial. The whole point is to change the code a little bit. It is not about C++, it is about making the change and seeing how it flows through the gut. Okay, so then you can stage your commits and uh, you can add commit messages as well. And you will see that how integrating your version control system with your issue tracker will provide you a history of uh, your changes. Basically tracking evolution of your project is a stepping stone in your uh, job onboarding. Many companies don't have this clear uh, job onboarding process and the first stage as you would be performing as an engineer, software engineer would be trying to figure out what changes were made for that particular piece of code where you are fixing a bug or maybe adding a feature. So understanding how these messages add value will help you write better messages in the future for others. Inherently Git supports easy branching and merging. This enables developers to work on different features in parallel. In this case, you will be simulating multiple branches to learn how this feature of Git works. There are commands to create new branches. You can give them branch names and then you can identify. And as we will see later that you can make certain decisions around these branches as well and maintain multiple code flows and check how they are behaving. So this is where the evolution into software engineering is becoming more and more prominent because your code hasn't changed a lot. Originally, Git's intent is to help collaborating with others. So Git simplifies collaboration by allowing the same project to be modified simultaneously in isolation from the changes uh, each individual developer is making, right? So you can create your local copy or uh, you can actually retrieve the updates from other branches as well, right? So Git provides all these facilities and with GitHub, it is 
even uh, possible to do certain things in the browser itself. So that's the evolution of the tool which we are talking about, which can benefit your productivity immensely. And if you are making certain changes in the browser, remember your environment is no longer available in the browser. The browser is not seeing your environment. So there you have to understand how GitHub is going to help you simulate that environment if possible and how you can actually use tool to improve your productivity. So now you are thinking like a software engineer, not just a C++ developer. In essence, static analysis tools are programs that analyze your code without actually executing it. They scan your code for potential issues uh, such as memory leaks, uh, null pointer dereferences, and uninitialized variables. They can also help you enforce coding standards and best practices. Uh, like you should be avoiding global variables in C++. You should have a const correctness that if you are not going to change something, might as well pass it as a const. And are you handling the errors properly? These are just a few to name. They can actually perform more sophisticated actions as well. And hence having them as part of your build pipeline is an asset. Using static analysis tools can save you time and effort in finding and fixing issues and bugs in your code. So they can also help you improve the quality and readability of your code. And remember, these tools are maintained by different teams who are totally dedicated on making these tools better. So they are definitely doing something on your behalf, which is going to save your time. These tools can actually reduce the amount of time people spend bickering during code reviews as well. Because now everything is automated and standardized. Hence, people once they decide what are the rules they want to follow, they can just put it in these tools and that becomes the standard for your code base. So there is no argument on every pull request as to what should be happening. Some examples of static analysis tools are CPP check, Clang Tidy and PBS Studio. In the coming lectures, we will just talk about them very briefly so that you can explore them as part of the uh, issue tracker assignments which you are going to be performing. CPP Check is an open source static analysis tool and it can analyze C++ code for potential issues as we discussed. So it can be the, uh, detect various types of errors such as uninitialized variables, out of bound array access, null pointer dereference and memory leaks. It can also check for coding standard violations such as unused variables, missing const correctness and unsafe functions. This is how you can actually automate your programming practices. As I mentioned earlier, bickering during code reviews is a waste of time. Automate it out. CPP check happens to be easy to use and it can be integrated with popular uh, IDEs such as Visual Studio, Eclipse, CLion and others. It is also available as a standline command line too. So uh, basically it, the choice always remains yours. But the only thing is that the IDEs are always local to your machine. And uh, if you want to integrate it them uh, in your build pipeline, then you will have to use the standalone utility which I am suggesting that you should be doing as part of the assignments that are going to be handed off to you. Because remember, in this course, you are building an end-to-end -end pipeline for any C++ code to go through all these checks, right? So once this pipeline is set, you can freely write your code and focus on the code's logic only. The rest of the infrastructure will be set. That is the value add we are looking for by this uh, exercise. Clang Tidy is another open source static analysis tool that is part of the LLVM compiler uh, infrastructure tools. It is primarily designed to work with the Clang compiler, which is the LLVM based uh, C++ compiler. Uh, it has a wide range of checks and again it can check for memory management issues, coding style violations and performance issues. So in terms of features, it is kind of equivalent to uh, CPP check. Uh, the point is that it is part of the LLVM tools. 
So it is just another implementation of static analysis tools and you can explore it further to find if there is any particular feature which you like uh, only uh, in Clang Tidy. So accordingly you can choose at the runtime which tool you need. Clang Tidy is highly configurable and it supports a wide range of checks along with customization. So you can shape the tool based on what you need. In the current scenario, you can start with the defaults and very simple stuff. But once you start getting your hand uh, in the tool, then you can actually start modifying it for doing complex things for production. So it can be integrated with all the popular IDEs like Visual Studio C Lion but it can also be used as a command line tool, standalone command line tool, which is highly beneficial if you are using a non-clang compiler, right? So uh, focus on these minute aspects because this is what will help you build the best possible pipeline uh, which can deliver all these checks based on the appropriate tools. So you shouldn't get stuck because you didn't remember that this could be done standalone. The last one is the PBS Studio. This is a commercial static analysis tool. And again, it can uh, analyze potential issues. It can detect uh, memory management errors, uninitialized uh, variables, buffer overflows, type mismatches and other logical issues as well. So it can check for coding standard violations, naming conventions, formatting, readability. So again, it's a sophisticated tool. It is uh, well maintained because it's a commercial tool. It has a free trial available if you want to check out. There is another way of using this tool just to learn about its feature as well. It is through the Compiler Explorer. I will mention a little bit more about Compiler Explorer towards the end of the course. But uh, just in case I forget, uh, you can bookmark it now itself. Again, it's an online tool, Compiler Explorer, and it is very rich when it comes to learning the language. Like the other tools, PBS Studio is also highly configurable. It allows a lot of customizations. It has integrations with the popular IDEs as well. So uh, I request you that you check with uh, your employers if uh, they are willing to pay for this license. Otherwise, you can always fall back on the free tools. So I encourage you to uh, try out all the three tools and then decide which one is the most suitable for your costs and your team and accordingly use them. But remember, you must be using uh, static analysis. The rate at which the code delivery is moving, it is best to have static analysis tools in your build pipeline because if people are wasting time bickering in uh, around pull requests and in code reviews, you are in the wrong company. People are wasting your time. So either integrate these tools or start looking for a new job. Let's talk about the testing. Now here there are two important aspects, the automation and the testing in itself. So I will talk about the testing aspect of things. Automating is something which you will have to read from the documentation and integrate into the pipeline choices you will be making. So unit testing is a method of testing individual components or functions of a program. And you have to do that in isolation to ensure that that individual module is working correctly. Right. So in our code, the print functions job is to accept a string and print out uh, the string on the stud out. That's its job, irrespective of wherever it is being called from. So unit tests are something that will confirm this. So unit tests are typically written and maintained by developers and uh, they are used to identify bugs early in the development process. So if you make a certain change in a code and you notice that one of the tests is failing, then you can immediately spot that your change has introduced a bug. Because if it was building and working correctly earlier, then it should continue to do so after you have written your code and the new test cases, right? So I won't dive deeper into the aspect of unit test because that is part of programming practices. I have a dedicated course for that. But here to summarize from a tools perspective, 
it is to ensure that the integrity of the code hasn't been compromised. Integration testing is a method that focuses on interaction between different components or modules of a program. So integration tests helps to ensure that the entire system works after you have made certain changes, right? And uh, you can ensure this correctness when multiple components are combined together as well. So in the current example, writing an integration test will not be possible because you are working on only one small print function. But I request you that once the course suggested project is over, you evolve this into a more complex system with very simple modules. The modules need not be complex. It is the interactions which you are trying to learn about. So just use simple functions that call each other, which are modular in nature and try to simulate the interactions and see how your pipeline behaves. System testing is a high level testing method. Uh, and that evaluates the overall performance, reliability, and usability of the entire software system. So the system tests are usually performed after the unit and integration tests, and they will often involve end-to-end -end testing or simulating real-world user scenarios. So the best way to learn about system testings is uh, to check out some existing repository of a product that has been out there for a while you can check out uh, databases like MariaDB, Postgres or something, but this is an advanced stage of learning. So when I say advanced, it means that you understand all the things which we have discussed in this course, then you are ready to check out that particular code base and learn further. So it is just a matter of few weeks ahead. Uh, it doesn't mean that you don't have enough information to proceed around it. It is just that you are not prepared unless you finish this course uh, assignments yourself. Google test is a widely used C++ testing framework. Again, it is not the only uh, unit testing framework available out there. I'm suggesting it because it is widely used and hence it is up to date and maintained as well. And it being open source, it is easily available as well. So uh, you can use that. Uh, the installation procedure is kind of straightforward and it is available on its uh, GitHub page. I will provide you the link as well. So remember, as I mentioned earlier and keep mentioning throughout the course, you have to do this yourself. Don't wait for somebody to give you these uh, instructions on a platter and keep showing you on the screen all the time because that will slow down your career to almost a standstill. Remember the rate at which technology is moving, the careers are getting shorter. Don't get caught on the wrong side of your career growth. After installing, the next step would be to write a test case. So here you can see a simple uh, test case which I'm showing you. So in this case, you need to include the header, the gtest header, then your function uh, header, uh, in this case, it's a dummy my function. So you can have your different functions as well. So this, all this you will find in the documentation. Remember, you just have to write these basic test case for our hello world example. Don't dive deeper than that as part of this project. Your goal is to complete this pipeline as recommended by the course. That is your first objective learn to get out of documentation once you have enough context bookmark it and make notes what you need to do in future that is the only way you will be able to multitask in a software engineering project otherwise you will always be relying on your engineering manager to tell you what to do next and they will hesitate from promoting you to handle responsibilities on your own Please don't stall your career by waiting for somebody to spoon feed you with instructions. Finally, you will have to run these tests. So to run your Google test cases, compile your source files and the test uh, source files along with the, uh, you will have to attach to the Google test library. Again, the instructions will be on its Git, GitHub page, how to get started. And then it will generate the test binary and it will run the tests. So Google test will do a lot of work of discovery automatically and run the test cases and show you the results.
Now there, there are two phases to this. One is to run Google test locally on your system to understand how your basic test case is running. And the second step is integrating it into the build pipeline on GitHub. So you have to perform both these actions and you have to understand that how to uh, ensure that anyone who is checking out your code also benefits from this. Right? So it is a multifaceted problem. I will just mention a couple of integration testing frameworks. You can explore them further. So first one is Boost Test. It is a powerful testing framework that is passed part of the Boost C++ libraries. So it provides a wide range of features for creating and running integration tests, including uh, test case organization, test assertions, test output formatting. I request you to go over the uh, documentation for the same and try to simulate simple uh, test cases from which you can learn more about the framework. Not C++, but the framework. Remember, our goal is to understand the software engineering aspect of things first. So don't complicate your code. Just change it enough so that it will trigger this uh, particular integration testing properly. Catch2 is a lightweight header-only C++ testing framework. And it is quite easy to set up and use being header-only. So uh, it supports both unit test cases and integration testing. And it has a expressive syntax for writing test cases. So I definitely recommend you to try this out as well. So uh, it would be a good sequence to try Google test first, then catch two, and then finally boost uh, test. After selecting a testing framework, Create the test cases that focus on interactions between different components of the program. So follow the framework's documentation for guidance on writing and organizing your test cases, as well as compiling and running them. And uh, most of this, you should be able to uh, do this on your local system itself, right? And you should be regularly running uh, them as part of your development process. That is the second phase which I spoke about that this should be integrated in your build pipeline in your version control system aligned with your version control system in the cloud right so it's a two-step process first understand the framework by setting it up locally and then integrate it into your pipeline and that's where software engineering aspect of things will become far more clearer to you In essence, uh, debugging tools are programs that help identify and fix errors and bugs in your code. So uh, it's a very elementary definition, but uh, sometimes it is necessary to be very pedantic because uh, people might confuse a lot of tools for each other and end up using debugging tools way too early into investigations. So it is best to inform people and hope that they use them when it is appropriate to use them. Debugging tools are important because they can help you understand the behavior of your code uh, while it is executing. And you can identify issues related to memory management, logic and performance. Sometimes you can use the debugging tools uh, to understand the code flow as well. So there need not be an error in it. It is just that the reading the code is not enough. You want to see it executing and observe it as it is executing. And that's when debugger can help you as well. So debugging tools are essential for software development because they can ensure to uh, help you make your code reliable, efficient, and sometimes even secure because based on certain uh, values uh, and states, the code can remain uh, vulnerable to certain issues which you can solve if you are debugging during the workflow. So uh, we are just going to talk about the basic debugging tools which are available to you. And uh, you don't have to integrate them in your build system. You just have to learn how to use them to uh, spot errors in your program in production. So this is not part of the build. This is the uh, comes into equation when your code has been built, shipped, or you are uh, debugging something locally to understand it or fix it. So it is not part of your build pipeline, it is part of your runtime.
GDB is a popular open source debugging tool uh, which can help you analyze and debug your C++ code. So it can handle programs written in multiple languages as well and can be used on various platforms. Uh, GDB can be uh, helpful uh, in understanding how your code works and uh, basically it allows you to examine variables and execute code step by step and sometimes it can help you detect memory errors and segmentation faults as well. So uh, by having a control over how your code is executing, so you cannot change the uh, code flow as such, but you can slightly alter it by providing it certain new values and those are the nuances which a debugger can provide you. But remember that is not going to happen in production. You are simulating that environment in a separate setup. So always remember that that debugging productions is highly discouraged by attaching debugger. You have to use other logging techniques and other stuff. That is part of the deployment engineering and those kind of things. I have a separate course about it where you can learn about how to deal with production. But here you are talking about development only. GDB is uh, comparatively easy to use. Uh, it has a rich documentation which you can uh, always follow. It can be integrated with uh, most popular IDEs and it is also av available as a standalone command line tool. So always remember that to check whether any tool is available as a standalone utility as well because that can be really helpful. And you need to be aware of uh, the other aspects you need to change in your compile, uh, compilation commands to ensure that you can make most of GDB. So that will become evident to you as you start setting up GDB and uh, go through its documentation. So please remember that here you are setting up a build pipeline from a software engineering perspective for a very simple code. So the simplicity of code ensures that you have only two variables to think about software engineering and the tool features. So in this case, when I say Visual Studio Debugger, the Visual Studio I'm uh, referring to is the enterprise or the uh, Microsoft Visual Studio, not the open source uh, by, uh, or the freely available Visual Studio code. They are two different products. This one is the one which ships with the uh, Microsoft uh, MSVC compiler, right? So please don't confuse these two. Visual Studio Debugger is a powerful and flexible debugging tool and again it can help you analyze and debug your code. It can uh, handle programs uh, written in multiple languages and it can be used on variety of platforms as well. And it is a debugging tool so it brings in those features which we uh, spoke about in case of GDB as well like examining features, detecting memory leaks and uh, those kind of things. So from a feature perspective, it provides a similar kind of feature set that you would be looking for in any debugger. So uh, Visual Studio Debugger is again a finished product uh, coming from a stable vendor, which is Microsoft. So uh, it can be used as a standalone tool as well. But uh, the basic reason for Visual Studio Debugger being far more efficient on Windows platform is the fact that it is built by people who have uh, built Windows as well, which is basically the Microsoft team. So uh, that way, uh, if you happen to be working on a Windows environment, then Visual Studio Debugger should be your go-to solution. If you are working on a, a Mac or a Linux, then this will not be applicable. But on Windows, I recommend that you stick to the enterprise tools coming from Microsoft because the coherence in tools will help you uh, stay productive uh, for a longer uh, time. Other than that, uh, from a feature perspective, I wouldn't compare it with uh, e uh, any other debugger because the number of features are so vast that it doesn't make po uh, any sense. This is purely from a productivity perspective that whatever is available off the shelf, if everything is coming from my Microsoft, the integration will be far more uh, convenient. So uh, just investigate uh, from that perspective whenever you are changing stacks or moving from Linux to Windows or those kind of things, go with whatever mainstream is doing. Don't try to reinvent the wheel. 
LLDP is an open source debugging tool. Uh, again, it has similar features like GDP and Visual Studio uh, debugger. It can also handle programs written in multiple languages on variety of platforms. So from a feature uh, overall perspective, it is just another debugger which is going to be available to you. LLDB can be integrated with uh, many popular IDEs such as Xcode, CLion and uh, others. It can again be run as a standalone entity. So from that perspective, it sounds pretty similar. But the question now here which I am posing to you is which one will you integrate in your pipeline? Because you have to uh, take a call based on the target environment which you are going to be running your code in. And you also need to check that if you are deploying on a Linux machine as a target machine, your entire build system is targeted for Linux, but you are working on your Windows laptop, which has been provided by your organization, or if you have purchased your personal machine, or it happens to be a MacBook, how are you going to deal with these kind of bearing environments without actually uh, getting uh, vulnerable to making mistakes? Right? So it shouldn't happen that you are using the wrong debugger tool and uh, you couldn't set it up in time to fix a particular issue. You should have your setups ready all the time. Right? So this is the kind of inconsistency that you might see that you are compiling for a Linux target environment. The tool chains can perform cross-platform tasks, but are you uh, ready to do those kind of multitasking things and are you able to set up things in time to get started? That is the challenge which this course is throwing at you. And this is the only way to become an intermediate developer. Just taking courses and memorizing syntax is never going to be enough. This is how you grow. Do things yourself. Another set of tools which are uh, really handy and provided through the uh, compiler tool chain uh, are the address sanitizer and the undefined behavior sanitizer. I'm putting them as part of the debug tools because they uh, happen to be a kind of a debug mechanism, but they are done at compile time. So they can help you identifying memory related errors and undefined behavior errors because uh, the undefined behavior is one of the trickiest things in C++ because as the name says undefined behavior one really doesn't know what will happen but what is guaranteed is that something unexpected will happen that's it so uh, please try to integrate these tools in your pipeline up front and you can introduce certain errors to trigger these things to confirm that your pipeline can detect them that's how you ensure that the tools are working correctly first you have to simulate errors that's why we are keeping our original code simple hello world program you just tweak it enough to trigger these tools and confirm that your pipeline is working correctly. On the debugging front, here are some other tools which you can look at. So GDB server, this will allow you remote debugging. So if you have an application deployed in the cloud and have a GDB server running there, then you can connect a client from your dev machine. But remember, it can slow things down, so use it judiciously. GDB GUI is a client-side tool. It is a Python wrapper on top of GDB. So it can give you a nice interface while you are uh, working from command line. CGDB provides again a similar uh, interface and uh, it is built on NCurses. So it is very minimalistic and it can run on a remote SSH uh, command line features as well. GDB Online is a browser-based tool. This can help you debug small code snippets. While you are trying to understand new features of the language, you can just write a few lines of code and you can debug them using this browser-based tool. Uh, the Undo or UD, uh, UDB tool is a paid tool, but it allows a rich set of features for replaying your code and uh, try to debug uh, things in that session. So uh, you can uh, check it out with its free trial. I will provide you the URL for the same. And again, this is not a paid promotion. I will request you that if you cannot find a free trial, don't use it. It is not mandatory. Everything you have to think from a cost perspective. Software engineering is about minimizing costs. So if you can do the same things as UDB with open source tools in the same time, always go for the free one first. 
unless you can justify the costs, don't pay for it. Continuous integration uh, called CI and continuous deployment CD. Sometimes people call this continuous delivery as well. There are two various aspects to this. Uh, I won't get into details. For, from this course's perspective, it is basically getting your code into the target environment. So let's boil down continuous CD as that. So these two are essential practices in modern software engineering because they help maintain a high quality code and they streamline the development process and enable rapid updates to your software. And that's where the business has been heading for a while now because you cannot afford to sit on a feature for a very long time. The competition has got so tough that you have to ensure that if you are not shipping in time, you can uh, assume that you have lost at least a little bit of market share. That's the kind of attitude you need to have towards your features and your updates. And to do it with the highest code quality, you have to build this entire tooling ecosystem to ensure that human errors cannot slip through uh, at all. That is ideal. Some will still get through, but that number has to keep reducing all the time. The primary benefits of implementing a CI-CD uh, set of tools and practices is to ensure that your uh, project can uh, catch bugs early. Because catching bugs early will reduce integration issues. It will increase the stability of your software and it drastically reduces the time between development and deployment of new features and bug fixes. This is a, a primary pillar of success of the big tech companies because they have mastered their CI CD pipelines. They are not perfect. They are still evolving. They can still face a lot of issues. But as a developer who is starting off in their software career journey, you have to realize that irrespective of uh, tools like ChatGPT or others which can generate code, automating CI CD in itself requires a human effort because it is not just a bunch of scripts running. It is basically you are orchestrating a workflow of tools, right? It cannot be done out of the box. And as a human intelligence, you have to orchestrate it properly. And once it is in place, it can be considered automated. But out of the box, the integration between these tools has to be done by you as a human. And that's where this code is taking you. That beyond syntax lies this entire universe of uh, code delivery, which you have to master to stay in this industry for a long time. Uh, let's walk over some CI CD tools. Uh, I would recommend you go over the documentation and then choose one. All of them will work for you. But the thing you have to remember is that you have to deliver the end result to a end user. So think from that perspective. First one is Jenkins. Uh, it is a popular open source CI CD tool. You can self host it and it offers a wide range of plugins and integrations. So it supports uh, C++ projects and can be used for both continuous integration and deployment. So you can look at uh, its documentation. I'll provide you the link. It can be hosted uh, on your laptop as well. It is not a very uh, high memory consuming utility. So for experimentation, you can start locally, but remember your end goal that you have to integrate it with your issue tracker system as well, right? So you have to remember that uh, your code is getting checked in in a version control system in the cloud. Your uh, issue tracking system will be also in a cloud and uh, your CICD tools now have to ensure that they can integrate these two systems. Rambus CI is a cloud-based CI CD service that integrates with uh, GitHub repositories. So uh, Travis CI provides support for C++ project and its uh, configuration is typically defined in a .travis.yml YAML file. Again, you can go over the uh, documentation, check if it is freely available and then decide if you want to experiment with, uh, with it or not. GitHub Actions is a CI CD service provided by GitHub themselves and they allow you to create custom workflows for building, testing and deploying your C++ code. 
So GitHub Actions, again, is defined by a YAML file, uh, which is a particular format of writing a file. And uh, it can be triggered by various events, such as code pushes, pull requests. So now you are working in a purely collaborative manner. You have to think about your code delivery uh, as a primary objective. It is not just about spitting out some syntax somewhere and getting over with it. You have to think like a software engineer, not just a simple coder. There are multiple cloud uh, vendor provided solutions as well, like AWS Code Deploy, Google Cloud Build, Azure Pipelines. So these are services provided by the cloud vendors themselves. They provide a variety of features for building, testing, deploying, uh, like the other tools. And uh, you can choose a service based on your existing infrastructure in your workplace or your specific requirement. So this is something which I will uh, request you to try out after your first iteration is done. So one way of doing could be that you work with Jenkins first on your local setup. Once you have confidence, then move to GitHub Actions and then uh, at your workplace, whichever cloud vendor is being used, you can dive deeper into how it is being managed at your workplace. So then you will have a better idea as to how your work development environment is integrated end to end. So I'll just walk over what I expect you to do. This will be provided in your assignment tasks as well, which you would be entering in your issue tracker. You would be putting your estimated time, which you feel right now uh, you might be needing to complete this task. And after completion, you put the actual numbers and compare. Remember, I had informed you that this is a self-checking uh, mechanism. A certificate or uh, anything else cannot uh, test this. This is about your honesty to your own skills. Okay, so the first thing you will be doing is uh, setting up a CICD tool of your choice. Follow the documentation, pick the one uh, which you are most comfortable with to start. You don't have to pick only one, you have to work out iteratively. Use one at a time and decide what you are trying to achieve. Right, so once you have set one up, integrate your project and Git repository. Most uh, tools will offer a seamless integration. So you will have to be aware of the uh, caveats of logins and ensuring that uh, they can access the servers securely. So that will be another learning for you. And then you have to automate your build, test and code quality checks. So your static analysis tools, your build tools and your unit test and integration test tools also need to be integrated in this. So you are building an entire uh, CICD pipeline. You are not merely uh, writing the hello world, but you are actually building this entire pipeline and then you make a small change and try to trigger each tool. And that's where you can use separate branches to do this uh, thing. So that's how you can orchestrate a complex looking pipeline, but it is actually very trivial because now you understand each tool individually. All you are working on is how to orchestrate them together. And since your code is so simple, you are always sure as to what the outcome has to be, right? So this is how you get started in spotting errors by looking at simple patterns. Of course, the diff difficult life lies ahead in the production code, but that you need not worry about. First, get your basics in shape. Now you need to think about production. So you have to set up a separate environment for staging and production, right? Because this will ensure that your C++ application works correctly before deploying it to the end users. We are always thinking about the end users uh, as the final consumer, right? So the staging environment allows you to test new features and bug fixes in a controlled setting. So uh, this might be more applicable to server-side applications, but this can be done for client-side applications as well, where the final outcome will not be a service that gets deployed, but an installer that gets created, which will be made available to the end users. So the outcome can be variable, but the idea of staging environments remains the same, where you are trying to simulate the final uh, environment where the code is going to run and confirming that everything is in place. You need to choose a deployment strategy that 
best fits your application's requirements and the infrastructure which you uh, have available. So things like uh, rolling deployments, blue, blue green deployments, canary deployments. So th these strategies help minimize the downtime and reduce the risk of introducing certain new issues directly into the uh, uh, final ecosystem. If at all you are facing certain issues in your deployment process, they will be staggered out by these strategies. If you are delivering a client application, then uh, if you are like in this particular case, we are writing a simple hello world application. Right? So there is no downtime and those kind of things involved. Right? So here you have to just confirm that the functionality is met and then you are delivering it uh, correctly as an executable for the right platform. But once this pipeline is ready and you have finished all the tasks from this course, I encourage you to write a server application. I have a dedicated course around it as well. The kind of challenges you can face there and the kind of things you can learn around concurrency, you can learn uh, around how to do error handling, those kind of things. So writing a server is one of the best ways to learn any programming language from a production perspective. But before that, you need to have this pipeline where your errors will be caught. Otherwise, you will just end up coding a lot and uh, not learning because there was nothing to catch your errors, right? So if you want to do self-learning and coding, setting up these kind of projects is mandatory as a, a first step of learning. So implement monitoring and logging for your uh, application to track its performance, detect issues and facilitate debugging. So you can configure your CI/CD tools to enable quick rollback of deployments uh, in case of critical issues so that uh, there is a minimal impact on the end users. So this is something which you will have to simulate once you understand the tool better, right? So for now you can keep it as an optional activity, but eventually uh, you will have to come to this as part of your learning curve. So mention this task as one of the backlog tasks in your issue tracker. Profiling tools are programs that analyze the performance of your code and identify the hotspots and bottlenecks. So they can help you optimize your code and improve its performance. Profiling tools can also help you identify memory leaks, thread synchronization issues and other performance related problems. So now you can see that we are moving more towards the runtime issues where the code is functional but it is not performing as well as it can. And that's where we are trying to make it better. Using profiling tools can uh, save you time and effort in identifying and fixing performance issues in your code. So they can also help you improve scalability and reliability of your code, right? So uh, I will give you uh, examples of a few profiling tools as well, but you need to remember that this has got everything to do at the runtime. And you cannot run this in production directly because a lot of this tooling is intrusive by definition. So there is no unknown there. Profiling is basically measuring a lot of things at runtime. So it incurs a slight overhead. And that overhead sometimes in production is not uh, acceptable because if you are serving billions of customers, every nanosecond counts. And this kind of uh, instrumentations can uh, become a little heavy when you are measuring things in nanoseconds or lesser, right? So uh, be judicious about these tools in production, but to get there, you need to understand what they are doing, right? So you need to start practicing with them uh, way early in your career. And that's what this course is helping you do. Some examples which we'll uh, look at are uh, Valgrind, Google Performance Tools and Intel VTune Amplifier. I'll just basically introduce you to uh, these tools. Again, as earlier, you have to uh, take down the tasks, experiment with them, and keep focusing on the goal that you don't have to completely memorize their documentation or go through the entire thing. You just have to get the simple thing done that integrate it in your build pipeline for the Hello World program. First, get that functional and working only do what is necessary to get that functional. After that, you can dive deeper because now you know about these tools and you don't need another Udemy course which calls beginner to master only for Valgrind or only for Google Performance Tool. You know how to analyze the problem at hand and get it done using a tool.
Balgrin is an open source profiling tool. It can help you detect memory leaks, race conditions, and other issues related to memory management. It can also be used for profiling code performance and analyzing threat behaviors. It uh, is actually a suite of tools. Some of the other tools are Memcheck, CacheGrin, and Callgrin. Callgrin, and each of them uh, have their own specific features. You can go over the documentation. And they are all installed under the same Valgrind uh, application. You have to pass different parameters while executing to invoke uh, the exact tool which you want to work with. So as a tool, Valgrind can be integrated with most popular IDEs. It is also available as a standalone command line tool. So you can integrate it in your build pipeline as well. But uh, remember, it is a analysis tool which is quite thorough in nature. So it has to be kind of intrusive and it is uh, not uh, advisable to use it blindly. Read a little bit more about it because it will be exposing certain things around concurrency and other stuff which you might not be aware of as a beginner programmer. So that is another learning opportunity for you. I have dedicated course around C++ concurrency where I dive deep into the memory model and other stuff. Uh, it's a dedicated course for concurrency. So uh, you will learn everything only about concurrency in C++ and uh, that is necessary if you are going to work with production code in near future. Remember Valgrind is a tool that is going to do a lot of memory analysis and other stuff so it is quite heavy when it comes to its execution so you cannot apply it directly to your production code because things will become very slow if you are running it on entire code base. So try to isolate smaller pieces of code, use particular unit test case executions to run under Valgrind to catch issues. So here you have to show your experience of using multiple tools and come up with the minimalistic uh, code section that you want to isolate. So this is where profiling and other things will help you to isolate which piece of code is problematic. Then you apply Valgrind to that particular piece of code by writing a unit test case around it and try to uh, get the uh, culprit in that small piece of code. Google Performance Tools is a set of profiling tools that can include CPU profiler, heap profiler, thread profiler. So these tools can uh, help you identify performance issues related to CPU usage, memory management, thread synchronization. And uh, these tools are highly optimized for large scale applications and can handle millions of lines of code with ease. So this is something which Valgrind inherently isn't built to do and Google Performance Tools can help you on that front. They are open source and uh, you can check them out uh, uh, on your local machine as well. Like other tools, these tools can be integrated with different IDEs like Visual Studio, C Lion and uh, others. They are also available as standalone command line tools. So from that perspective, you can integrate them into your build pipelines as well. Again, as I mentioned earlier, you have to be aware of what precise features you are looking at and accordingly configure it to get started with defaults and then introduce certain features which will trigger these tools and you can identify as to whether they are behaving correctly or not. Intel Btune and uh, uh, equivalent tool AMD Microprof are a similar uh, suite of tools. Both are freely available and they are uh, kind of hardware specific uh, to their platforms. And uh, Intel Btune is currently openly uh, available as part of the Intel's one open API uh, initiative. Earlier it used to be a licensed tool but now it is completely free. So you can analyze the performance of your code uh, your entire system, the threads, process level stuff, and it can identify uh, performance bottlenecks related to CPU, memory, and IOs. So it is a highly optimized tool for multi-core systems and can analyze uh, performance of parallel and distributed applications. So from a HPC perspective also, the high performance computing perspective also, it's a very rich tool. It takes a while to get used to it. So again, set it up initially try to uh, get the simplest of programs working using its rich documentation and then create issues to track down later.
right? Because you cannot master everything in a single shot. Remember, the focus of this course is to get that simplest piece of code through all these tools first so that you know how to install them, what are the complexities around them, what is the dependencies around them. And then you start diving deeper into whichever one is most relevant to your current field of work so that you can get a good appraisal. Let's keep it that simple. Intel BTUN can either be integrated with IDEs or it can be run remotely on different uh, machines where you are running a client on your uh, laptop and the servers are running in uh, somewhere in the cloud. Uh, it is also available as a standalone application where you generate a binary and then you can invoke it as a command line tool or through its rich GUI. So uh, go through the one API uh, VTM profiler uh, documentation. You can also look at the AMD's Microprof uh, utility. Based on the hardware which is at your disposal, you can use the appropriate one. Again, this one will be a little tricky to integrate in your build pipeline. So uh, run it standalone first. And uh, then later on, if you are running into production issues, these are much richer tools uh, compared to the other ones. So there, I think Google performance tools will be a better opportunity to compare uh, Intel BTUN with when you are working with the cloud instances. So Valgrin should be a last choice when uh, you are working with a large scale production environments, but for, from a beginner's perspective, start with Palgrind and try to understand the value these tools bring to your software engineering skills. In this section, uh, we'll explore some additional deployment alternatives for your C++ applications and uh, you can uh, use them to reach to different environments. With these tools, you can also ensure that your applications can be easily deployed and they can run in various contexts, whether it is on-premise or in the cloud or anywhere else. The idea is to introduce you to the variety of uh, ecosystems available to you. You need not dive into them immediately. But these are the something. Uh, these are things which you should make yourself familiar with immediately, so that whenever the opportunity arises, you are ready. You are not caught by surprise as to even if this was even possible or not. So uh, containers in general are a powerful tool for packaging applications into uh, lightweight, portable uh, environments or containers that can run on any platform where they are supported. So by containerizing, basically if the container runtime is available on that platform, your application packaged as a container can go and execute there, right? So you are completely uh, agnostic of the platform. You just ensure that you are packaging it correctly as a container and it will be deployed. And you can take care of the dependencies while building that uh, container and the rest, you need not worry about uh, what exists on the host environment. So some, sometimes containers are called as dockers. So it is basically uh, Docker is a company which uh, popularized containers the most. So it is actually a misnomer. So containers is the underlying uh, technology. Uh, Docker just happens to be a company. There are other options which have evolved in the recent years, which is Podman Builder. So I encourage you to understand them as well because they are the future. Right? So from a Kubernetes and those kind of perspective, you need to be aware of all the uh, uh, CNI compatible uh, container technologies. So uh, please invest in them accordingly. But for starters, you can uh, work with Docker and Docker Hub to uh, familiarize yourself with this package uh, option. You can deploy your application as a PaaS or platform as a service. So PaaS solutions abstract away the underlying infrastructure completely. So this allows you to focus on deploying and managing your C++ applications. So examples of PaaS services are Heroku, Google App Engine, Azure App Services. These platforms often provide built-in features for scaling, monitoring, and managing your application. But remember, all these things are maintained by cloud vendors, so they come at a cost. So you need to be aware that if you are using a free tier, only then try out these things. Otherwise, I would recommend that you work this out at your workplace with your manager 
and then based on that you can experiment these things as a team uh, with a very minimalistic cost set up by your IT infrastructure uh, teams right so don't end up paying for just experimenting with these tools or from your pocket ideally that is not recommended unless you are planning to give a cloud certification function as a service offerings enable you to deploy individual functions or microservices written in C++ without worrying about the underlying infrastructure so it sounds very similar to platform as a service but there are certain differences in the offerings and you can go over the details so the examples of a function as a service are AWS Lambda, Google Cloud Functions, Azure Functions. So this is particularly uh, killerly well suited for event driven and stateless workloads. So in our Hello World case, uh, there is no such thing. But I request you that once you have your Hello World working end to end, then you can start experimenting with uh, these things as well. So the idea is keep it simple enough just to trigger these tools. Don't add complexity. Just do enough to ensure that you, it justifies you using this tool. Kubernetes is again a powerful container orchestration platform and it can automate deployments, scaling and management of containerized applications. You can deploy the Docker image created uh, using your application into a Kubernetes cluster. Again, Kubernetes will manage its lifecycle and scaling, but that means you have to learn Kubernetes as well. So keep this as a backlog task. You can work it out on a certain other simple Kubernetes simulators which are available online like Katakoda and other things, but you will still have to create a YAML file to pull your Docker and other things. So whenever you are ready for your DevOps learning, that's when this task will become ideal starting point for you. You can deploy your application directly in cloud uh, based on the services provided by platforms like AWS Azure and Google Cloud. The main examples being AWS Elastic Beanstalk, uh, the uh, Azure app uh, services, the Google Cloud Run. So these tools will allow you to directly ship your uh, code into the target environment, cutting out a lot of uh, intermediate infrastructure maintenance on your part. So try to understand that what is the price you are paying for these particular services and how much productivity it adds to your particular use case. Remember, these tools are not for everyone, but as a developer, you should be in a position to identify if they add value or not. And accordingly, should you be paying for these utilities or not? Again, I'll remind you, these are circumstantial decisions. So there can't be a silver bullet answer whether you should or shouldn't use these tools. Deploying your application on a virtual machine provides you full control over the environment and allows for an easy scaling and management. So that is how the initial uh, migration to cloud uh, happens. It is sometimes called as lift and shift. So uh, popular cloud providers like AWS, Google, Azure offer a variety of VM options for hosting your applications. You can do it on your on-premise infrastructure as well. VMs can be installed on your laptop as well if you want to try out different uh, ecosystems. So Dockers uh, will provide you only a runtime which is operating on the same operating uh, system as the host, but virtual machines give you a flexibility of working with a completely different operating system without having to work on a separate machine as such or a physical hardware. On your own hardware, the new operating system will be simulated and you can uh, deploy a binary there and test out the outcome. Uh, there are various configuration management tools which will help you automate the setup, configuration, and management of your application's deployment under various environments. So using a configuration management tool can actually streamline the deployment process and ensure consistency across different environments. So uh, like development, staging, production, testing, Right, so this is where the DevOps philosophy comes in, where the developers are supposed to be aware of how to set up these pipelines and get used to it. And this course is helping you getting better at that. That's what software engineering is uh, all about. 
the developers knowing the entire life cycle of their code and being able to manage it with a minimal overhead and that's where a lot of cost cutting in the industry is happening right now as well so choosing a deployment strategy that best suits your applications requirement uh, and infrastructure is a skill and it only comes with experience so you need to implement monitoring logging backups to ensure the stability and reliability of your application you must stay up to date with uh, security practices and apply necessary patches and updates it to your environment to minimize the risk now this is where you have to evolve and think as a software engineer not just as a c++ programmer because remember our code is still that simple hello world program but all these tool settings are something that you must be aware of even if you are shipping a single line of code in production so that's the kind of uh, learning i am hoping you are willing to take up another interesting and upcoming way of deploying your applications is web assembly it is sometimes referred to as basm so uh, web assembly is a low level virtual machine that runs within your web browser so it is designed to be portable target for compilation of high level languages like c++ and rust and this enables deployment on the web for client and uh, sometimes even server applications so basm is designed to provide performance close to the native code right so uh, this uh, is done while maintaining the security and portability of web applications so it offers a compact binary format and makes it ideal for low latency applications like games and uh, it is also uh, possible to interoperate with javascript through a simple api so this is uh, uh, this has been used widely in games and it is coming up Uh, as part of other applications as well so this is the c++ meeting the browser universe you need to uh, compile your code into a compatible web assembly uh, unit and this can be done using uh, applications like uh, mscripten clang is also able to do this thing and uh, mscripten can help you generate a thin javascript wrapper as well which can be uh, used to invoke certain uh, invoke the apis which you are exposing through your uh, uh, c++ code and the thing is that you can actually experiment out with this web assembly using the simple hello world program itself by calling that print function out of it right so you don't need to complicate the code here the tool chain is evolving and that's what you are focusing on so without complicating that code try to create a web assembly for it and work with it so again you will have to walk over a certain set of documentations for mscripten etc but remember just stick to hello world and get only that much done you don't have to take a beginner to master course for every simple thing get used to reading documentations and getting things done once you have your web assembly ready you can uh, deploy it as a static website using a simple web server like nginx or uh, the uh, apache httpd whatever is available easily to you you can do this another option is you can deploy your application to a serverless uh, environment like the aws lambda or google cloud functions so uh, using the cloud uh, vendor provided solutions the scalability and flexibility uh, will be uh, available to you out of the box but you will have to pay for it as well Uh, another option is you can again like the earlier application you can uh, ship it to a pass platform as a service like heroku or google app engine and uh, that is quite easy to use because they are built for this kind of a use case so uh, web assembly is a powerful technology uh, so you can write high performance web applications in a language built for high performance which is c++ so with the right tool chain and deployment you can actually deploy your applications as a static website or in a serverless environment or as a pass environment so that is where your ci cd tool chain comes into equation as well but once you have this entire end to end deployment pipeline built you can start working with complex applications and you can purely focus on your code
let's look at certain real life uh, projects where uh, C++ is being used. So uh, first one is gaming. Uh, C++ is widely used uh, in the gaming industry because of its performance and uh, control over hardware resources. Uh, some of the popular games uh, that use C++ are Doom, World of Warcraft, the Unreal Engine itself based on which a lot of games are being developed and shipped. So uh, it, it is at heart of a gaming industry in many ways. So you must be aware of the kind of environments and performance requirements it uh, demands and then you can decide which subset of the language is most useful uh, to learn. So uh, in from a deployment perspective, again, you have to think about the performance tools that you will be using, the profiling tools you will be using, the concurrency requirements and those kind of things. The finance industry uses C++ heavily for its uh, high performance trading systems, algorithmic trading, risk management. So uh, some example applications are the Bloomberg uh, terminal, the Quantlib and Boost C++ libraries have certain uh, high uh, performance financial uh, library extensions. So uh, you can think about uh, these use cases from a software engineering perspective as to how will you ensure that these are performing at the highest level. That's where the challenge comes in apart from the syntax. Embedded systems is again uh, something which leverages the low level uh, hardware access of C++ and its compatibility with C. Uh, some examples where C++ has been used uh, is the Mars rover, the autonomous drones, self-driving cars and medical devices and there are many many more such applications. These are just the tip of the iceberg but you can dive deeper and uh, this is just to convince you that why using the right tooling can help you become a better programmer because now you can shift across these domains and you understand how to tweak your tooling so that you are delivering the best possible software for that particular domain, right? Not just in general, uh, but you are delivering solutions specific to that particular domain and the needs of that domain. There is a long list of projects, I won't go into detail, but some other notable ones which are out in the open source and you can take a look at are uh, the LLBM compiler infrastructure tools, the Boost C++ libraries, again they are written in C++ and uh, they contribute a lot to the standard library as well. OpenCV, the computer vision library, databases like MariaDB, Postgres, RocksDB, the Databricks Photon Engine, it is written in C++. Uh, machine learning and AI tools like TensorFlow and PyTorch, their core is written in C++ where the actual heavy lifting and data processing happens. The Python layer is the glue layer which uh, makes it easier to use, right? So if you can go to uh, the GitHub pages of TensorFlow and PyTorch, you will realize that the core of the code is written in C++. In this section, uh, I will suggest you certain things about uh, how to get more knowledge out of the interactions with C++ community. Because the important thing is that just taking a single course in C++ is not going to be enough. It is never going to be enough. You have to constantly keep learning because the language in itself is evolving. Newer standards are coming out and you must be aware of those new standards because if an opportunity presents itself, you should be able to work with them, right? And you shouldn't be rushing to a new standard assuming that that's what the market needs. Market will respect stability of a code base, not which standard it uses. And that is the sense of business you need to build in your decision making. And that's where these tools will help you make sure that you are delivering the best possible software, not just a, a shiny new version, which is unstable. Attending conferences and meetups is a great way of staying in touch with the language and the tools around it. More importantly, uh, it is coming from the practitioners, hence the tooling is uh, production tested. 
and that can save you a lot of time of discovery and the issues you might face in the future. So some of the conferences are like CPPCon, ACCU, Meeting C++. So you can follow this uh, URL and uh, you can get to uh, get the schedule of all the conferences which have happened and are in future. Right. So uh, and don't forget that these have their own online versions where they upload their uh, talks. They have uh, some of them have YouTube channels which are actively maintained with the talks being uploaded after the conference. So just stay tuned to these places for getting more information about the tools ecosystem as well as the language. Contributing to open source projects can also help you understand the tooling ecosystem better. So if you can look at projects like Boost, LLVM, Qt, there are many other framework based projects as well. You can look at uh, database projects like RocksDB, MySQL, Postgres. Look at it purely from a tooling perspective. Don't dive deep into the code unless you want to understand the uh, kind of use cases they are solving. Here you just look at their build setups, how they are built up, how they are uh, using branching and merging. Right? Purely look at it from a software engineering perspective. And you will learn a lot of things over there as well because these are high performance uh, products when I was uh, talking about databases you know how they are measuring performance how they are ensuring that they are profiling their code so that's where you can leverage open source to learn and if you can spot some minor issues there in documentation etc you can start contributing as well You are encouraged to uh, participate in online forums such as Reddit, Stack Overflow, and GitHub. Only thing is, online forums can be vulnerable to bullies and a lot of chatter which is kind of useless to your career. So be very judicious about the time you are spending on uh, these portals. Remember, you are looking for a very specific answer to improve your career or you are trying to help someone who has asked a question. But this, these are optional activities. So don't focus on uh, investing time in these unless you really have that time. Unless you are on the right track in your career, just hanging out on these portals is waste of time. So always have the value proposition in your mind before you start investing time on these portals. Another reminder is about using online tools. So uh, the three tools which I'll tell you to explore definitely are uh, Compiler Explorer, Online GDB and CPP Check. Remember, you don't have to always use an IDE to understand a concept. You can use these tools, especially Compiler Explorer, which is rich with all the nightly builds of uh, all the available compilers for different target machines as well as it has integration with a lot of third party tools uh, like PSV Studio, CPP Check. So you must be in a position to take a call as to what you are really trying to get done. Are you focusing on the tool or are you focusing on the language? And if you are focusing on the language, online tools are the best way to get started and move fast. Because uh, there is no need to set up this huge pipeline which you saw to sort out something which is very trivial feature of a language, right? So please be judicious in understanding your tools correctly and choose the right ones at the right time. That is the secret source of a great software career. Engineering is all about using the right tool at the right time. It is not about memorizing the syntax. I'll keep reminding you this thing time and time again, that you have to focus on your career. Just memorizing syntax is pointless. Please don't do that. To recap, in the course we spoke about compilers like uh, GCC, Clang, MSVC. We spoke about CMake which is a build system. We spoke about Git which is a version control system and its role and importance in software engineering automated testing and CICD frameworks that how they can ensure that you are delivering the solution to the end user. The goal 
is to become a software engineer who can solve the end user's problem. It is not to become someone who can copy paste code from a search engine console. So you must understand the importance of these tools and now it is up to you to follow up. We also discussed about the importance of staying up to date with the C++ advancements, how you can engage with the community to ensure that you are not doing the discovery part all over again. And uh, you can practice and experiment with projects. This can be your first project where you are integrating so many tools and trying to understand them using very simple code and concept. This is how you build your experimentation muscle which will be very helpful when you are doing POCs and other kind of things as you grow in your software engineering career. The other ways of additional uh, information for you is uh, basically books and online courses. There is no replacement for books. Do not ignore the fact that certain things can only be taught as a elongated con context which is best captured in a book. Online courses can give you certain pointers but there is no replacement for a book. Invest in books. Blogs and forums are good for current information or something very specific or niche which doesn't require a detailed overview of the entire language. So certain experimental code and those kind of things you can get from blogs and forums. And again, conferences and meetups are a great place to get to know uh, different use cases and people. So don't ignore them. If they are available in your city, please do participate in them. So this advice comes as an answer to a question I asked myself as an instructor and uh, some as a developer with 17 plus years of experience that how to explain the vast possibilities to any developer who thinks that only knowing syntax is enough to become a software engineer. And uh, this course is an attempt in that direction. So are the rest of my courses. And uh, basically it is boiling down to a point where uh, interviews are becoming a bit of a mockery, but uh, that is not my place to comment. So I will stick to certain simple advices which uh, you can think about and if you agree, you can adopt in your uh, uh, daily engineering. When knowing the syntax of a programming language is important, it is only the beginning of what it takes to become a successful software engineer. So there are many other aspects of software development, including design, architecture, debugging, testing, optimization, planning, the capacity planning, and that requires a deep understanding of software engineering concepts and best practices. So please don't just limit yourself to syntax. Software development is not just about writing code. It's about understanding the broader context of what you're trying to achieve. And this includes understanding what the user needs, what are their requirements, how the business is shaped around your particular code base, what are the goals of your organization, the technology ecosystem in which your software will operate. And without this broader context, even the best written code may not meet the needs of the end user or serve the purpose of the organization. So from a business perspective, it will be discarded. And with a half a million people being laid off in the past few months in early 2023, the evidence is out there. Software development and software engineering are not solo activities. It requires effective collaboration and teamwork with other developers, stakeholders, and users to ensure that the software meets the needs and expectations of all involved parties. So don't work in a silo. Software development is a constantly evolving field with uh, new tools, technologies, and practices emerging all the time based on how the 
world is shaping up around software. So as a software engineer, it is essential for you to stay up to date with the latest advancements and you have to continuously improve your skills and knowledge to deliver the best software. Tools are the best way to automate things out and have a consistent process in place. So remember, you have to rely on tools. You cannot keep doing everything manually. You have to understand automation and you have to strive to achieve autonomous systems. Right? So think in terms of SRE. The most important thing is that technical skills are definitely essential. But soft skills such as communication, problem solving and time management are equally important. Software development often involves complex projects with tight deadlines and multiple stakeholders. So this makes it critical to have strong soft skills to succeed as a software engineer. Remember with a lot of technology being thrown at software development, the pressure is also increasing a lot. I am building courses to help people not burn out before they can achieve their financial goals. And this is becoming a rampant problem in software industry across the globe, where people are burning out much, much earlier compared to other industries. So I just hope by understanding these points, as developers, you can see the vast possibilities that are available in the field of software engineering and the importance of developing a broad skill set beyond knowing the syntax. So staying focused on what is required and learning the right tools is your best bet of saving yourself from a burnout in near future and staying relevant long enough in the industry to achieve your financial goals. In the end, I would just like to say, finish this project on your own and you will feel far more productive and confident about your skills around C++ in matter of weeks. You don't require anything else. All you need is to focus on the right things and pick your battles correctly. I hope you liked the course. If not, please let me know your feedback and the improvements that can be made to this course. Good luck and goodbye.